streamers are being so lazy, it might be illegal. That's right, professional live streamer XQC is facing accusations of stealing content for his own reaction videos while making a complete mockery of other people's intellectual property rights. Oh, hold on. This part's great. Man, I love this guy. Welcome back, Legal Eaglets. Today, it's time to think like a lawyer because we're going to be covering one of the most misunderstood aspects of copyright law, fair use. So hold on because it depends. But for those not in the know, XQC is one of the most popular and highest paid internet personalities. Over the past decade, the 27 year old French Canadian has cultivated a dedicated following for his unique style of unfiltered commentary for video game live streams and YouTube videos. <laughs> Now, XQC's most recent controversy kicked off when he uploaded a video to his YouTube channel showing himself reacting to another creator's video on the JFK assassination. About to return to ground level, given spotted Oswald approaching. But while reaction videos typically involve lots of pausing and constructive commentary on selected clips, XQC's video is almost exclusively just him watching the entirety of another person's 90 minute video. This triggered an influx of backlash from other YouTubers who accused XQC of free writing off of another creator's hard work, all while reaping financial rewards via clicks and ad revenue. XQC is saying next to nothing. Again, it's just like, wow, this video is popular. So I'm gonna sit in the corner and my audience will do basically whatever I say and I'll say it next to nothing and make free money. And to make matters worse, sometimes he even keeps the video playing while he leaves to use the bathroom or make lunch. Allowed various war Do not pose this to YouTube for the lack of react, for the lack of react. Boom! And of course, XQC is not the only streamer who reacts to other people's videos in real time with almost no commentary. It's all over the place. Now, XQC claims he's done nothing wrong and accused his critics of being envious of his success. Now, as a YouTuber who has produced my own share of reaction videos and had their videos reacted to by others, this is an issue that is near and dear to my heart, and more importantly, my wallet. And the transformative nature of fair use is one of the most misunderstood areas of the law on the internet. So today, let's take a deep dive into one of the most heated debates on online content creation and fair use that's happening right now. Now, Felix Lingyell, better known as XQC, has spent nearly a decade building a devoted online following as a former top-ranked competitive Overwatch player turned streamer and content creator. And on the live streaming platform Twitch and now Kick, uh, XQC regularly chats with fans, hosts reality shows, and broadcasts himself playing video games. Count to woo, 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 woo. Yeah. <laughs> And on his YouTube channel, XUC makes general videos on a variety of topics, including videos of himself reacting to other creators' content uh, and often re-uploading his live streams. Now, XQC is no stranger to controversy, and if anything, he revels in it. He's been historically suspended from Twitch for various reasons, ranging from a copyright strike for live streaming the Tokyo Olympics to an incident where he uploaded a brief clip of two gorillas mating, which he claims was by accident. And XQC has also blurted out homophobic, sexist, or otherwise bizarre comments during live streams. But ironically, the famously outspoken XQC now finds himself under fire for the things he doesn't say during his reaction videos. Now, most recently, XQC kicked the hornet's nest on July 24th, 2023, when he posted a video onto his YouTube channel titled The Kennedy Assassination, XQC Reacts to Lemino. But XQC's video is not so much a reaction video as it is mostly just him watching an entire 90 minute JFK documentary in silence. A number of YouTubers accused XQC of stealing the content of a fellow creator while providing almost zero commentary that would make the video his own. First, it was Bub Films taking XQC to task. Then some ordinary gamers joined the fray, describing the video as garbage. And this isn't the first time that XQC's non-reactive reaction videos have actually stirred controversy. Neo, a YouTuber who creates educational videos, uh, who you can also find on Nebula, uh, criticized XQC for leaving the room five seconds into reacting to Neo's video and only coming back 10 minutes later, which Neo described as XQC, quote, making a mockery out of the fact that he is not reacting. He also provided a graph showing that there was no viewership boost for Neo during and after XQC's broadcast. On the streaming site Kick, which XQC recently made a $100 million deal to join, one of XQC's first streams went south after a member of Kick staff had to jump into the chat to stop him from streaming the entirety of The Dark Knight. He then found himself temporarily hidden from Kick's directory, aka Shadow Band, uh, for a second copyright violation for streaming Breaking Bad. Now, addressing the backlash to the Kennedy video, XQC asserted in a live stream that he paused like crazy and added a lot of commentary to very generous statements. Bro, 
I paused like crazy, added a lot of commentary. Chat, the reason why I didn't commentate is that streams are content. Streams in their entirety are content. He then claimed he only rushed through because his chat was, quote, getting mad. And after going on one of his trademark rants, he added, quote, Yes, a lot of it is just watching it because that's what chat wants. If I commentate too much, chat gets bored. Now, we'll talk about legal defenses in the future, but this is just classic. The chat got bored, so it's okay to commit copyright infringement. Uh, I'm, I'm sure he's fine here. But on Twitter, XQC hit back at some ordinary gamers, writing, quote, I'm watching a vid I like to my people, that's it. Whatever that means. Now, XQC reacted to Neo's response uh, with this incomprehensible video. Chat, did this get re-uploaded? Chat, is this video re-uploaded or not? Wait, it didn't. Wait, it, it didn't. So, so what the problem? So, what's the problem then? People say that it's when you upload it to the same platform and that's the problem. Yeah, so what I think he's trying to say, and don't quote me on this, is that he told his editor or his social media guy not to republish his live stream to YouTube, thinking that that somehow absolved him of copyright infringement. That's not the case. Now, what this gibbering mouther fails to understand is that it's copyright infringement whether it takes place during a live stream or during a video on demand or a, a re-upload. It doesn't matter whether it's live or not. It's still copyright infringement. It just might be harder to actually find if uh, there's no actual recorded video of it, if it was a live stream that just went off into the ether. And actually when XQC was called out during the live stream of reacting to Neo's video uh, for the lack of commentary, uh, XQC just gets angry and, and makes some stuff up. Uh, talking about uh, some nonsense reaction about the, the metal of the pillars and stuff. Oh, metal pipes, Monko, cement, coming, Monko, football, oh, go at the back. Monko. Wait a minute chat, wait a minute chat, hold up. I think this is, a, this is a very rare copper alloy right there, chat. But it highlights the lack of actual commentary. You can't just describe what you're seeing and call it commentary. That's not going to qualify. And it, it highlights the lack of anything of value that's being added and the lack of uh, transformativeness of these reactions. But XUC described uh, some ordinary gamers take as quote, unfounded criticism full of personal attacks and asked some ordinary gamers why this triggers him so much. Now, speaking as a lawyer and YouTuber, uh, the reason this triggers uh, some people, especially content creators, is that XQC seems to be basically stealing other people's hard work under the guise of creating a reaction video, uh, which we'll talk about whether it's a reaction or not. But besides the legality of it, there are a wide variety of attitudes toward reaction content in the streaming community itself. Ethan Klein, a YouTuber and co-host of the H3 podcast, has emerged as a prominent voice on fair use and one of the fiercest critics of non-reactive content creators. And on the August 7th episode of the H3 podcast, Klein and XQC debated what counts as fair use with respect to hosting content. XQC accused Klein of doing the same thing by featuring smaller creators' content on his platform. You it's, keep saying that. You're doing it. Not you're doing it. You're doing it. You call me a, you call me a thief piece of shit. But yeah. you're doing it. You haven't proven that. I don't know why you keep saying that. However, a key difference is that H3 rarely plays a video in its entirety. And XQC asserted that his live reactions give exposure to smaller creators, which set up a furious response from Klein. Nice try. You literally do it to enrich yourself. You're a multimillionaire and you steal content from small creators and you don't give a f about their rights or what they want. You're not creating right. anything big for anyone. You're just taking attention and views for yourself and you don't give a f about the... The, uh, the consequences of that. It's not your decision to make that for other people's property. Now, the debate devolved into finger pointing and insults with Klein cutting off the stream, but not before XQC asserted people would rather watch him do the worm than watch Klein's podcast, and he then did so. He, oh, okay, sure. I mean, that's content, man. It's, ori uh, it's original that, content, at least. Like yes, it? do that, bro. Uh, do like it. And in the wake of all of this controversy, YouTuber Meat Canyon created a parody of XQC in a video he called uh, The Tragedy of a Reaction Streamer, in which XQC is portrayed as a smaug-like monster hoarding views, though ironically, <laughs> the XQC golem in this video seems to be actually more coherent than the real thing. Very fun, I liked it a lot. Make sure to leave a like, a click on the bell, and the a thing, and oh shit, I'm doing the pose. And then things got meta when XQC reacted to the video by barely reacting. Uh, the, the views check I could, I did, maybe I could fight it. <laughs> and then things got really meta when Meat Canyon reacted to XQC's reaction by barely reacting.
Though ironically, Meat Canyon's reaction is probably the one that's most likely to qualify as fair use uh, because uh, under some circumstances, parody can be fair use. And if I was his lawyer, I'd argue the parody only works if he reacts to the whole thing without reacting. Uh, copyright can be really weird sometimes. Of course, copyright can be hard. It's why you need a good lawyer. But if you want a great lawyer, my firm, the Eagle Team, can help. If you or a loved one has suffered from cancer, suffered an injury or death in the family, or were involved in a car crash, we can represent you or help find you the right attorney who can. Just click on the link in the description for a free consultation with my team. Because you don't just need a legal team, you need the Eagle Team. So, link below. Now back to thieving streamers. And this is a perfect opportunity to talk about one of my very favorite cases that actually involves Ethan Klein. Now, originally Ethan Klein found fame through his YouTube channel, H3H3 Productions, uh, which was hosted by himself and his wife, Hila. Now, their content included sketch comedy and reaction videos that satirize internet culture, and it was one of their biting reaction videos that landed them in federal court. Because in February of 2016, Ethan and Hila posted a video mercilessly mocking the video of another fellow YouTuber, Matt Hosenseida. Uh, in which his character, uh, the big bold guy, uh, attempts to seduce a love interest using the power of parkour. Strong shoulders. He wrote that in, by the way. Um, I don't recommend that you watch this video. It is the most cringeworthy thing you have ever seen in your entire life. And for some reason, it still exists on YouTube. But the client's 14 minute reaction video included numerous clips of the big bold guy's supremely cringe video interspersed with their own commentary and jokes. And frankly, they played almost the entire video itself while they were commentating on it. I feel so objectified. You can have me. Holy f of course. And it's just that easy, <laughs> baby. And in response, Hodenzida, known online as Matt Haas, sued the pair in federal court for copyright infringement and DMCA violations. And in the original complaint, Haas accused the clients of reproducing virtually all of the work as, quote, nothing more than a prop in their comedy routine. And after the clients posted a video discussing the lawsuit, Haas added a defamation claim as well. But Judge Catherine Forrest of the Southern District of New York rejected all of Haas's claims, ruling that the client's video constituted quintessential criticism and comment that clearly fell within the bounds of fair use. In her analysis, Judge Forrest highlighted that the heart of the fair use inquiry is the extent to which the purpose and character of the use is transformative by adding something new with further purpose or different character. Noting that commentary and criticism have a strong presumption in favor of fair use, she cites various jokes and comments the clients made about the video, like calling Haas the king of cringe tube, criticizing what they found to be unrealistic dialogue between Haas and the parkour actress, and mocking the plaintiff's parkour ability. And Judge Forrest also analyzed uh, to what extent the Klein's video uh, usurped the demand for Haas's work by serving as a market substitute. And citing the Supreme Court's ruling in Campbell versus Acuff Rose, AKA the Two Live Crew case, Judge Forrest noted that uh, lethal parody may indeed hurt demand for the original work, and the injury may even be intentional, but that does not produce a harm cognizable under the Copyright Act. And accordingly, Judge Forrest found that the client's video, replete with criticism and mockery, is, quote, decidedly not a market substitute for the Haas video, holding that the client's video constituted fair use. Uh, Judge Forrest then dismissed the claims of copyright infringement and the DMCA violation, and she also tossed the defamation action, deeming the offending statements non-actionable opinions. And Ethan Klein rightfully declared this ruling a huge victory for fair use on YouTube. But in a footnote, Judge Forrest also cautioned, quote, the court is not ruling here that all reaction videos constitute fair use. She then provided helpful guidance for why the Klein's video was fair use, but other reaction videos might not be. Quote, some reaction videos, like the Klein video, intersperse short segments of another's work with criticism and commentary, while others are more akin to a group viewing session with without commentary. Now, even though this case is 70 years old now, it's a great rundown of the fair use factors, especially in the context of an actual YouTube case, which is why I cite this case in uh, every single one of my video descriptions. And if Lemino or Neo or others decide to sue XQC for copyright infringement, I can pretty much guarantee that they'll quote from this decision to argue that XQC's videos are a group viewing session without commentary, not entitled to any fair use defense. So let's run through this analysis for what XQC is doing and figure out whether he has a fair use defense or whether it's copyright infringement. Now, fair use is a legal doctrine that allows unlicensed use of copyrighted material in certain circumstances. As an affirmative defense to infringement, fair use seeks to balance the property interests of copyright holders with the public interests of encouraging freedom of expression and the wider 
distribution of creative works. And while fair use is decided on a case by case basis, there are certain enumerated activities that are uh, laid out in the Copyright Act as potentially qualifying for fair use. And that includes criticism, commentary, news reporting, and research. And that is not an exhaustive list. And in determining whether a particular use of a copyrighted work constitutes fair use, courts will consider the following four factors as codified in section 107 of the Copyright Act. And no factor is determinative. You have to weigh every single one of them. The first factor is the purpose and character of the use, including whether the use is of a commercial nature or for a nonprofit educational purpose. Uh, the second is the nature of the copyrighted work, uh, the amount and substantiality of the portion used in relation to the copyrighted work as a whole, and the effect of the use upon the potential market for or value of the copyrighted work. So for the first factor, courts examine how the party claiming fair use is using the copyrighted work. And while non-commercial and educational uses are more likely to be deemed fair, making money from the use of another's work doesn't automatically preclude a fair use finding. Instead, the key inquiry is to the extent the use is considered transformative. And the example that I often use is that Jurassic Park was originally a novel written by Michael Crichton. Then eventually it was turned into a movie, uh, Jurassic Park, uh, created by Steven Spielberg. Now, the movie is a derivative of the novel. And while it was transformative to turn the novel into a movie, you better believe that Steven Spielberg got permission and was able to license the IP to turn the novel into a movie. If Steven Spielberg had not gotten permission, that would have been copyright infringement. And that's why fair use can be tricky because for it to qualify as fair use, it has to be transformative. It has to create something new, but it also has to be for the purpose and character of one of the fair use uh, categories that the law recognizes as uh, available to use for fair use, whether it's education or whether it's commentary, criticism, or parody. The purpose has to be there as well as it being transformative. Being transformative alone is not enough. And in fact, that can make it copyright infringement. Now, whether something is transformative is a pretty complicated subject. I could make an entire video just on whether something is transformative, but here's what the Supreme Court said in the Two Live Crew case. Uh, quote, the central purpose of the purpose and character of use inquiry is to see whether the new work merely supersedes the objects of the original creation or instead adds something new with a further purpose or different character, altering the first with new expression, meaning, or message. And in that case, the Supreme Court held that the rap group uh, Two Live Crew's commercial parody of Roy Orbison's song, Oh Pretty Woman, was non-infringing fair use. <laughs> The court also found that the more transformative of the new work, the less significant uh, the other three factors are. And as a result, the first prong has historically been the most decisive in fair use determinations. And generally speaking, you're supposed to take the minimum amount necessary to create the transformative work that you're creating. Now, parody is a little bit different. There, in an exception, you sort of need to take at least enough for people to get the joke. You have to be able to conjure up the thoughts of the original for the parody to work. But generally speaking, for fair use, you're supposed to take the absolute minimum necessary. Now, there's a little bit of gray area in terms of what is minimum and, and what's not, but still, generally speaking, you're not gonna be able to take the entirety of a work uh, and simply play it in the background. And this is the heart of the criticism against XQC, namely that his reaction videos are insufficiently transformative to constitute fair use. Now, the second factor is the nature of the copyrighted work, which analyzes the degree to which the work that was used relates to the copyright purpose of encouraging creative expression. In short, the use of copyrighted material uh, from a work of fiction weighs in favor of finding infringement, while taking from a factual work, likely a news item, is more likely to be deemed fair use. But uh, frankly, the, the courts don't put very much uh, import uh, for this particular factor, unless uh, the work has never been published before. But the third prong considers the quantity and quality of the copyrighted work that was used in relation to the copyrighted work as a whole. So in other words, fair use is less likely to be found when large portions of a copyrighted work are used, uh, or if you're taking the heart of the copyrighted work itself. So in other words, fair use is much less likely to be found when large portions of a copyrighted work are used, and you're much more likely to be able to mount a fair use defense when you only use small portions. But in some contexts, even taking a small amount of a copyrighted material can render a use unfair if the selection constitutes a substantial part of the work or the heart of the work itself. So for example, in a case called Harper and Row versus Nation Enterprises, the Supreme Court held that a news article's quotation of fewer than 400 words from President Gerald Ford's 200,000 word memoir constituted the heart of the work, 
and the use was ultimately found to be infringing. And the reason there is because the magazine published the part of Ford's memoir that related to pardoning Richard Nixon, which apparently was the only reason you would ever read Gerald Ford's memoir. So this would be another strike against XQC because XQC and these other live streamers are just republishing the entirety of the other YouTube videos and then reacting to it. Now, as we saw in the Klein case, uh, just because you republish virtually all of a video doesn't necessarily mean that you can't mount a fair use defense, but it makes it really, really hard. And the more that you cite, the more you're going to have to add commentary or some new transformative meaning to your secondary video. And then the fourth and final factor focuses on whether and to what extent the unlicensed use saps the demand for the protected work by serving as a market substitute. In other words, in assessing this factor, courts consider whether the use is hurting the current market for the original work, for example, by displacing sales of the original uh, or preventing uh, people from watching the original video uh, and or whether the use could cause substantial harm if it were to become widespread. And I think this is yet another strike against XQC because when you republish virtually the entire portion of another person's video and then you're not commenting on it uh, with new meaning and commentary, uh, why would anyone then watch the original video? Uh, they've already seen the video on your live stream. Now, as someone who has made dozens of reaction videos for this channel, and as a lawyer uh, who has a vested interest in not getting sued for copyright infringement, I have a lot of experience on how these reaction videos are supposed to work. Or at least that's how Gamerant feels about my channel. Uh, but to give uh, another example, when I reacted to uh, the movie, My Cousin Vinny, I didn't post the entire movie, and I didn't just show myself watching it, however fun that might have been. Uh, instead, I took clips and punctuated them with my actual legal commentary. Uh, you see, the traditional way of making reaction videos is to actually react to the videos. Well, disclose, you dickhead. <laughs> hey, I just said that. Now, creators who stream for long periods of time assert that, of course, there will be dead air while they eat or go to the bathroom. But the problem with that argument is that by the nature of live streaming, you can't take the minimal amount necessary as required under the fair use factor. And instead, you're playing the whole thing in real time, and you're not making any discretionary choice as to what is actually republished. And yeah, biology might dictate that you might need to take a bathroom break, but that's not a defense to copyright infringement. That's a live streamer problem, not a content creator problem. I have to through the bathroom. So yes, leaving to take a break will almost certainly violate copyright due to the lack of commentary, but arguably so does just watching it in real time if there's no commentary being made. And this highlights why it might actually be impossible for any live streamer to have a live stream reaction where they're just simply playing the entire video and reacting. Because there's been no forethought about what's the minimum necessary to make the point of the commentary or the point of the criticism. They're just playing the entire thing and interjecting some little bits of commentary or, or criticism. Oh, it's like a bean. Obvious. And courts don't look fondly when you use the entirety of the work. So yes, you could add some original commentary to your reaction, but if it completely displaces the market for the original, it's probably not fair use. And it's pretty obvious that once you see a video during a live stream, the way that most of these live streamers do it, you're not gonna go back and watch the whole video again. Let's be honest, this kind of reaction content is extremely low effort and easy to do. Why? Because you're just piggybacking on the work of the original person. And whether XQC is in the room or not, there's an argument to be made that his borderline incoherent babbling might not even qualify as the commentary or criticism necessary for fair use anyway. Honestly, I think my dog could offer about the same level of incisive commentary as XQC during most of his live streams. Yeah, if you wanna feel bad, just remember that apparently this garbage is apparently worth $100 million to the streaming platform Kick. But there are some live streamers who do things the right way. If you get permission or you get a license from the person who owns the rights to the videos, then by all means, it's great that you are getting that permission and then reacting to it. And if you want an example of people who do reaction content right that aren't lawyers on YouTube, there's the popular YouTuber Ludwig. Not only has he created his own video differentiating between a genuine reaction video and stolen content, he's also held in high regard among other content creators for his ethical streaming practices. Uh, in particular, he asks for permission. Uh, and when he reacts to a fantastic series like Jetlag, 
also available on Nebula. Uh, he continually suggests that people sign up for Nebula so they can watch Jet Lag where it was originally published. So Ludwig is evidence that it's not impossible. And another example of someone who does reaction content the right way is Dr. Mike. He is only looking at little snippets, and then he is talking about how that snippet relates to his chosen practice. Obviously, medicine. Now, you don't have to be a lawyer or a doctor to do reaction content. You do need to make commentary about the uh, thing you are reviewing, and you, generally speaking, can't use the entirety of the work. You should have some forethought about what you're going to use and what's not necessary. And ultimately, non-transformative re-uploading of videos hurts content creators, free rides off of their hard work, and likely infringes on their IP rights. If these videos are re-uploaded in their entirety, it should be left up to the original content creator to approve or reject it. And remember, there's a super easy way to get around this. Just ask permission from the original content creator. Though in defense of live streaming reaction videos, Hassan Abi said, quote, 90% of creators don't mind. They like it when we're watching their videos. I'm a content creator, and I love it when people react to my videos. But the thing is that even if 90% of those people would agree to it if you ask them, you still have to ask them or it's copyright infringement. And that of course uh, leaves out at least 10%, it's probably more than 10% of content creators do actually mind and you are explicitly going against their wishes. So ultimately the easiest way around this that's good for everyone is just ask for permission. But streamers need to realize that not only is it legally required to ask for permission in many, if not most of these circumstances, as well as it being the morally right thing to do, it's also in their pecuniary interest. Someday a lawyer is going to explain the concept of statutory damages to them, and they're not going to be happy about that. Uh, until then, you can support creators directly by getting a membership to today's sponsor, Nebula. Neo and I are not only on Nebula, but we're both co-owners because Nebula is a streaming platform built for and by creators. And this month only, they're doing something wild. Just until the end of the month, Nebula is offering a lifetime membership. Instead of a subscription, it's a one-time payment that will get you everything Nebula offers forever. I've seen a lot of speculation about this. No, Nebula is not going bankrupt, Linus. Uh, on the contrary, it's more successful than it's ever been. Uh, but we're offering lifetime memberships for a select few fans so that we can make even more original content huge productions from your favorite creators. And we're in it for the long haul. Lifetime memberships allow us to not take on outside investors. It's the opposite of a going out of business sale. It's a going into much bigger business sale. And if you're new here, Nebula offers tons of exclusive videos from me, original series from your favorite people, movies, plays, classes, and more, uh, including the hit series Jet Lag that Ludwig was actually raving about. And with your favorites like Neo, Jet Lag, Real Engineering, Real Life Lore, and Legal Eagle, we create the content that other people actually react to. You can see my feature length documentary, Bad Law Words Good, and my other Nebula exclusive content includes my full length interview with the screenwriter of My Cousin Vinny, uh, and my not safe for work video uh, about lawsuits that are too hot for YouTube. But like I said, for this month only, you can get an exclusive lifetime membership. It's $300 for life, no tricks, no gimmicks, that's it forever. And if that's not your speed, that's completely fine. You can still get a 40% discount on yearly subscriptions that pencils out to less than $3 per month. If you wanna pay monthly, you have that option too. So click on the link that's on screen now or down below to get your lifetime membership or a huge 40% discount. Uh, just click right now down below before that deal goes away. And then after that, click on this link over here for more Legal Eagle or I'll see you in court.